Okay, let's get started, folks. Get my tie the right way there. How's everybody doing? It's not raining? Yay. I think it's the first time this term for us. How you doing? Good. Um, so we're slogging our way through protein structure. And last time I talked about primary structure, which was the sequence of amino acids. I also talked about secondary structure, which involved the uh, sort of ways that amino acids close to each other can interact. And they gave rise to two structures that I described that were what I called regular structures. One was the alpha helix, and the other was the beta strands that can be arranged into beta sheets. And I didn't point out to you something that's very important. The person who discovered those structures, who reported those structures, won the Nobel Prize for those structures is the person whose name is going on that building across the way. That was Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling won one of his two Nobel Prizes for that work. That was a very cool thing. So the Linus Pauling Science Center um, uh, is going up um, because of, uh, partly because of his uh, knowledge of those, or his, his um, determination of those structures. Well, as you probably have seen, as you've looked ahead in the, in the uh, notes, you've seen that we have primary structures, we have secondary structures, and we're going to start talking about uh, tertiary structures. One of the things I didn't mention, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for it, but I'll just show it to you. I pointed out yesterday there were a couple of angles that were on there, and I want to just explain them so you know what they are. I'm not going to hold you responsible for this. So remember I had these planes of um, pep the peptide bonds. I had a peptide bond one here, I had a peptide bond here, and I said these things can rotate, right, relative to each other, and they do. And those guys have angles. Those angles are called phi and psi. And so if you ever hear that expression of phi and psi angles, they're talking about how these planes are rotating relative to each other. And there's an entire area of protein structure that uses those angles um, to help predict overall giant structure of proteins. And that work was done by a very famous scientist known as Ramachandran. And again, you're not responsible for this, but I just pointed out to you uh, so sometimes you'll hear those terms, Ramachandran plots, uh, to help uh, describe protein structure. And they actually tell us a lot about what can happen in a protein because those angles, as you might imagine, there are certain angles that these guys can't rotate because these R groups start bumping into each other. And um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that to you briefly. So, uh, so in case you hear that elsewhere, you know what that refers to. All right. Um, I want to talk now about the, the, the structure that's probably the easiest one for you to understand. <clears throat> okay? Well, perhaps primary is the easiest, right? Primary is a sequence of amino acids. Secondary is a little harder to get your head around. You've got to think about these helices or these pleats or whatever. Tertiary structure is what we think of as the structure that happens when we have a folded protein. So remember that I said that fibrous proteins don't have folds for the most part. They just go on and on and on and on. Folded proteins, however, have folds in them. So they'll have maybe a little region of alpha helix, and then a fold, and then another little region of alpha helix, and then a fold, and then maybe a beta strand, and then a fold. Okay? So <clears throat> the vast majority of proteins on the face of the Earth are not fibrous proteins. They're what we call globular proteins. And globular proteins are folded proteins. Globular proteins have tertiary structure. So globular proteins have tertiary structure, which means they have folds in them. And by far, okay, tertiary, uh, there, there are many more globular proteins than there are fibrous proteins. Fibrous proteins don't really have much tertiary structure. Okay? Enzymes are globular proteins. I know of no enzymes in the world that are fibrous. Okay? The vast majority of proteins are globular in nature. And so we need to now think about those folds that give rise to this globular structure. You might wonder why they call it globular. Because if you had it sitting out on the table, it would look like a glob. That's literally it. Okay? It's literally a glob. It looks like, oh, what is that? Well, it's more than just a glob. That structure is very important for the function of that protein. Just like any protein, we disturb structure, we disturb function. What looks like it might be a random glob is actually very specific and very important 
for that particular protein. All right. So I'm going to give you some examples today, and we're hopefully going to uh, see and understand why that structure and function relationship is so uh, tight. Well, before I do that, I want to open the door now to some other forces that help us to envision what holds a globular protein together. What forces did I say held together secondary structure? Hydrogen bonds, for the most part, are pretty much the most important things. And that's because these guys are interacting fairly close, and the hydrogen bonds capabilities are all there. When we look at a globular protein, there's other things that come into play. Okay? So first of all, I want to define tertiary structure for you. So globular protein has tertiary structure. I want to define that structure. Tertiary structure arises from interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary sequence. So remember, secondary was interactions between amino acids that were close in primary sequence. And by close, we said less than 10. For tertiary, we're talking about interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary sequence, which means more than 10. And what we see is that the type of interactions that they have now grow. We see a lot more possibilities for interactions between side chains. And I'm going to show these to you. Okay. All right. So this figure, I'm pointing my pointer the wrong way, this figure sort of schematically shows what might be a globular protein. It would be an unusual one, but let's say this is a globular protein that I have there. And this is now going to show me all of the different interactions that can happen. That is, forces that can stabilize the tertiary structure. So this is showing us forces that stabilize the tertiary structure. Okay? Well, what might they be? Well, first of all, let's uh, start over here. Okay? We see an NH3 plus and we see a COO minus. What are they doing? They're attracting each other, right? Charges can stabilize tertiary structure. Remember, charges are different than hydrogen bonds. Charges are different than hydrogen bonds. Charges involve a plus or a minus. Not a partial plus and a partial minus, but a plus and a minus. If I take a proton off of something, it's going to lose a positive charge. If I put a proton onto something, it's going to gain a positive charge. So if I have a plus next to a minus, we can imagine that they're attracted to each other, and now they are helping to hold this guy in its right configuration and stabilize that structure. Stabilizing structure is very important, because if we don't stabilize the structure, it falls apart. We don't stabilize this Linus Pauling building over here. We start putting people into it. It's going to fall apart. So we want to have it stabilized, and now we're talking about the forces that are helping to stabilize it. OK, charges will do that. OK, here is a hydrogen bond. We see hydrogen bonds can also help to stabilize the structure of a protein, the tertiary structure of a protein. OK, so hydrogen bonds are helping to stabilize the tertiary structure of this protein. Not surprising. We saw hydrogen bonds happening in secondary structure. Now we're seeing them happening in tertiary structure as well. Look at this guy. Disulfide bonds. I told, I described them to you, but now you see them. Disulfide bonds occur when you put the side chains of two cysteines next to each other. What happens is they get rid of the hydrogens that are between them, and they make a sulfur-sulfur bond called a disulfide bond. And that is a covalent bond. Of all the forces I'm describing to you here, that is the strongest one the biggest girder out there that has the biggest bolts in it attached to everything else. That's the stablest structure that's part of that building. This is the biggest girder with the biggest bolts holding on to everything. OK? Yeah? It's a good question. Can it be any covalent bond? We generally don't see other covalent bonds between amino acids. The peptide bonds hold individual amino acids together, but this is occurring between, let's say, amino acid number 41 and amino acid number 70. That is, they're not immediately next to each other, and they're, they're pointing together like that. So we don't generally see covalent, other types of covalent bonds besides disulfide bonds. The one exception to that was I talked about collagen last time. 
And I said how those OH groups can come together and make a covalent bond. That's one exception. But there's not many. Yes? Yeah. Tertiary structures will usually have all of these forces stabilizing it. Yes? Do a lot of those forces like, come apart like, when you're heating them? Like, Good question. So do a lot of those forces come apart when you're heating them? And the answer is they can. The one that can't is the disulfide. That's the strongest one. Okay? It takes a tremendous amount of energy to break the disulfide bond. There are chemicals that you can use to break disulfide bonds. But in terms of heat, no. Heat will not break a disulfide bond. Okay, now, here's something that probably you haven't thought about. Hydrophobic interactions. Hydrophobic interactions are important, all right? Well, what are hydrophobic interactions? You remember that these are things that don't like water. So I talked about hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and amphiphilic on the first day. Everybody remember that? So the side chains of some amino acids are hydrophobic. They're not real fond of water. They don't have ions. They don't have hydroxyl groups. They can't hydrogen bond. And so they really don't like to associate with water. When it comes to associating, likes attract likes. Okay? Unless maybe you're at Peacock late on Friday night, in which case, who knows what may happen, right? Okay, that's a little different situation. But in any event, the side chains of these amino acids do not like water. So if they can, this protein folds to put these side chains close to each other so they can associate with each other. Now, that is a very important principle. <clears throat> because if we take all the globular proteins and we look at all of the globular proteins, we discover something interesting. Most of them have on their inside, we can think of the inside and outside when it folds up, on the inside, that's where we find the hydrophobic interactions. On the inside of that protein, there's no water, and they can associate with each other. That means that the hydrophilic interactions, that is the amino acids that like water, are generally folded on the outside so they can interact with water. That's kind of cool. So there's a very uneven distribution of amino acids when we look at that overall folded structure. The hydrophilics on the outside, the hydrophobics on the inside. Hydrophobic interactions are a stabilizing force. In fact, everything you see up here is a stabilizing force. They're not as strong as covalent. Covalent is the strongest. But hydrophobic interactions can contribute a decent amount of stability to the overall structure of a protein. The one I'll say the least about is metal. Metals can, uh, in some cases, as you see here, sort of coordinate and help hold together a structure via electronic interactions. It's not something we'll talk about in here, but I just want to make you aware that metallic uh, bonds also help to stabilize the structure of some proteins. Not all proteins have metals in them. But some proteins have that as a stabilizing force. Yes, sir? Inside of the glob. So that glob is there. We can think of the glob as a big three-dimensional surface. So we can think of an outside with the things that are facing the water. And I'm talking about on the inside of that. So it will literally fold itself up into a little compact ball is what it will do. Matt? Does it fold in response to water or does it fold in Very good question. Does it fold in response to water? The, the, um, it turns out that the folding is favored in water because these guys are seeking each other out and trying to get away from water. So it's the water that actually does help to facilitate that folding. These guys are going to be protein structure experts here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so do hydrophilic interactions help stabilize structure? And in fact, they do. Okay, so some of the things that we see out here uh, are charge. We could think of hydrophilic interactions as a hydrogen bond because hydrogen bonds are part of hydrophilic type interactions. So absolutely, we can see hydrophilic out there as well. Okay, all right. Um, what else do we see? Well, we see this protein has.